here since we're getting some more folks in. I'm going to stop my video just so that y'all don't need to see my face while I present. You just need to see the slides. So. <clears throat> we minimize. Okay. Okay. So can everyone hear me okay? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move this out of the way. There we go. Okay. Um, well, thank you for being here. Welcome everybody. Um, this is the uh, Domestic Violence Intervention Program Services RFQ Info Session. Um, I appreciate you all being here today. Um, and we're here from 10 to 12. We may not need or use all that time. Um, but hopefully you, you get information out of this session that you feel like, um, you know, we're making good use of the time, um, and I'll, I'll kind of get started, um, right now, I guess. Okay. So, um, before I get into, um, the introductions and, and kind of, um, Kind of the, the housekeeping around this uh, information session. Um, always like to do a land and labor acknowledgement um, within um, our organization. Um, so uh, would like to begin with uh, acknowledging that much of what we know of this country today, including its culture, its economic growth and development throughout history and across time, has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who suffered the horror of transatlantic, transatlantic trafficking of their people battle slavery and Jim Crow. We are indebted to their labor and their sacrifice, and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence throughout the generations and resulting impact that can be felt and witnessed today. That's a statement from Dr. Tara T.J. Stewart. And um, our land acknowledgement is that we are currently occupying the unceded lands of many uh, First Peoples, Coast Salish people, Muckleshoot, Suquamish, Stillaguamish, and Duwamish. We acknowledge and thank local First Nations for their centuries of land stewardship that long predates the arrival of European settlers. And we, um, and we honor those who are still struggling for recognition and reparations for historical acts of genocide and ongoing erasure. We remind you to be aware of the spaces that you occupy locally, that these lands were stolen from First People in the name of white settler colonialism, and that you seek ways to continue your education and give back to local indigenous communities. And um, I've included some links here um, that we can share with you after if you're interested um, regarding which native land you occupy, as well as ways to uh, give back to the Duwamish, uh, the Duwamish people. So I'm going to move on. So we'd like to begin um, letting folks know that um, the state of Washington's Public Records Act um, under Washington state law um, that dictates proprietary and confidential information states that all information is received or created by the city of Seattle um, within this process are considered public record. And what that means is that public disclosure uh, requests can be submitted and then um, and give an answer uh, through the information shared in this in this process. Um, these records include but are not limited to uh, the narrative responses you give, uh, budget worksheets board rosters and other materials, uh, including any written or electronic correspondence. So for instance, if you have a question of me um, as the funding process advisor um, that, and I respond to you, that information is considered disclosable. Um, in addition, HSD uh, application materials are released to rating committee members and all rating committee members must sign and adhere to a confidential, confidentiality and conflict of interest statement. Um, personal identifiable information, so um, we have some examples listed here, um, that are entered on these materials are subject to Washington State um, Public Records Act disclosures and um, could be also subject to a third party requester, um, any sort of request that happens basically. So um, <clears throat> examples of personally identifiable information, as you may know, are names, date of birth, social security numbers, uh, financial account numbers, or any driver's license or ID numbers. Um, generally, we don't require social security numbers on application materials. 
um, and for doing business with the city or HSD, it's recommended to um, kind of obtain a federal taxpayer identification number. Um, so please let us know if there's any reason why your identity needs to remain private for any safety reasons. Um, we're open to we're open to that possibility. So. So gotten that out of the way, the kind of legal, legalistic aspect of things, but um, welcome. And um, I wanted to say thank you for being here today. Um, all the information shared in the chat box, just so you know, will be included in our notes for today's meeting. So if you would like to refrain from introductions, um, if you don't want to have this information be recorded or subject to disclosure, you um, or in the notes, you don't have to use your, your name uh, to introduce yourself. Um, but if you are comfortable with those things, um, I would encourage you to, in the chat box, and if desired, please type your name and pronouns, your title and role, as well as your agency and department. Um, so just for me, my name is Carmen Sher Caraggio. Um, I am a senior planner with HSD um, and um, MODBSA um, specifically, um, working at the City of Seattle. So if you're comfortable at sharing that information as it pertains to you in the chat box, you're welcome to. Um, some housekeeping things just generally, um, please remain muted um, uh, unless you plan to speak and be and be heard. Um, it just helps cut down on some of the noise. Um, I know that you know we're all we're all busy and we're kind of shuffling things around. So try to keep that um, uh, mute button uh, muted so that that's not interfering as much. Um, there will be uh, time set aside for questions and answers in the middle and at the end of the presentation. Um, I've set aside questions, uh, time for questions kind of after we sum up the programmatic aspects of um, the DVIP services and then again at the very end of the whole presentation um, in case anything else kind of comes up while you're, while you're thinking. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Thank you, everyone, for putting your introductions in the chat. OK, so some additional housekeeping tips. Um, you may have noticed that we're using the WebEx platform today. Um, and commonly, the city uses you know, several different kind of platforms, but this is what we've gone with for accessibility um, reasons and just for, for flexibility of use for uh, external partners. Um, there's a couple buttons that you might want to kind of familiarize yourself with. The mute button is just a little microphone. It has a slash through it. That means you're muted. Um, and the nice thing about WebEx is it'll beep at you if you've unmuted yourself. So you'll usually know um, that you have unmuted yourself. Um, and there's the obviously the start stop video. This is the share screen button, which you probably won't need because I will be sharing the presentation for the duration of this meeting. This is the record button. Um, if you'd like to see the participants participating in the meeting, you can click this button here. This little bubble is the chat function, so you can see the chat um, by clicking that um, that option. And, and call is over here. Um, we are recording the session and it will become public record, so you can, like I said, choose to be anonymous during the session if you choose. Um, but uh, if not, then that's, that is also fine. And always love to see, always love to see some names pop up in the chat. So. OK, so this is the agenda for uh, today's information session. Um, we're, we've already kind of gone through the welcome and general housekeeping, um, and we'll kind of uh, go through some of the introductions um, and, um, and kind of around the program, and then the purpose and background, uh, service model and components, followed by our department's theory of change and how the service model and components kind of fit into that theory of change. And then after that uh, will be kind of the intercession of question and answer, the first question and answer session, so that folks can kind of ask questions about the actual programmatic uh, kind of details. And then after that, I'll get more into the logistics of the funding process around uh, things like submission instructions, um rating tips um the appeals process and then just a uh, final q a um, and close at the end so there will be like i said two different uh kind of sessions for question and answer so if you don't have any burning questions after the first you can save it for later too so options 
So to kind of introduce you all to um, this process and, and the program um, here is the city of uh, Seattle requires that public dollars are released every four years to competitive bids. So the last time we did this obviously was 2018. So we're, we're on that cycle again and we're looking to release funding. Um, this is the DVIP uh, services RFQ. It is an open and competitive funding process. Existing grantees um, are not guaranteed to be selected, continue to be funded or funded at the same level. Um, and renewal is contingent upon agency performance. And I'll get into those performance metrics uh, a little bit later so that you'll know kind of what, what will be expected of you in terms of performance metrics if, you're, if you should apply. Um, approximately uh, 1,407, um, 100, $147,229 is being made available, excuse me, um, through our general fund. Um, so that's that's what we're bidding out, and uh, the the period for this funding is uh, the next calendar year, so beginning January 1, 2023, through the end of the year 2023. Um, so. so really quickly, I wanted to kind of go through the timeline so that you can kind of see where within this process we are. Um, this is kind of an all year kind of process and um, for us anyway, leading up to, so you can kind of see what's happening behind the scenes. Right now, um, obviously we're here, um, we're having our info session. Um, last day to submit questions. Um, if you reviewed the guideline and uh, application document that was sent out um, during the announcement um, is July 29th um, at 5 p.m. Our application deadline for this process is August 8th at noon Pacific Standard Time. Um, and we want you to submit your applications online. Um, we will not be accepting hard copy applications. Um, and there will be two different ways that you can submit online. So, um, and I'll go over those at the kind of towards the end. Um, but so you can kind of see the next um, kind of. Um, set of questions or set of uh, timeline moments here. Um, let's see here. Okay, sorry, I have a lag on my end, sorry, it's weird. Okay, so um, the next process kind of that takes place after um, the application date closes is review and rating process, um, which is gonna be most of, it's gonna take up most of August, um, kind of roughly through the, the 9th to the 25th. Um, we'll be making our award announcement on uh, September September 30th, and the appeals process will take place during the first week of October. Um, contract negotiations will then take place from October through um, the end of the year 2022, and as I mentioned before, the contract start date would be January 1st. So to get you into kind of the purpose and, and background of um, domestic violence intervention programming, um, the purpose of this funding process is to improve Seattle's coordinated community response to DV. Um, we know that DV is a community problem that is very broad and deep, and so this is um, meant to kind of work towards creating a more um, kind of networked response to that very prevalent issue. Um, we're looking to enhance partnerships and collaboration among service providers and intimate partner violence response systems, meaning um, the court, uh, community, as well as systems, victim advocates, treatment providers, and uh, probation services. Um, we're looking to provide treatment for offenders that is rooted in accountability and that centers the needs of survivor safety. We're beginning here, obviously, domestic violence intervention involves intervening at the level of the offender. Um, and we recognize that that may, may seem counterintuitive, but ultimately the, the goal um, is to invest in survivor safety um, at, the, at the very outset. And finally, obviously advance uh, racial and social justice um, within the Seattle community. We know that marginalized communities locally um, are more uh, disproportionately impacted by um, domestic violence in terms of um, economic and uh, social consequences um, that are faced by those communities. So we uh, we recognize that and we want this to be um, we want this to be a uh, race forward uh, solution. All right, there's a chat entering there. That was cool. 
Oh, apologize, folks. I think I'm getting a little bit of a lag, so I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So purpose and background, um, a little bit, a little bit more, um, kind of more on the model that we're looking to um, kind of work for here is um, DVIP treatment and approach um, can look different um, from kind of location to location, but um, our program was adapted from what is known as the Colorado Differentiated Domestic Violence Offender Treatment Model. Sometimes it's just called more casually the Colorado model because it's much shorter. Um, it emphasizes the use of risks and needs um, and responsivity principles of effective interventions. So essentially that looks at um, risks and, uh, of the offender to their partner and then the needs of that partner and then respons responsivity um, in ways that you can intervene to make those, um, to reduce those, uh, those risks. So after being court mandated, offenders um, are assessed for their criminogenic risk factors um, and then are assigned one of three treatment levels um, based on their level of risk and as defined by Washington State Administrative Code. And um, just so that you're aware, um, I've, I've linked these in the slides. I will be including the links um, in the chat at the very end of the presentation. Um, I've created kind of a small index of links that I have here in the presentation that you'll be able to reference after the fact. So. Um, fourth tier offenders, uh, there are um, there are multiple levels. It goes up to, I believe, four tiers. Um, uh, fourth tier offenders are not actually part of the eligible population for treatment within the model that we're using um, for the purposes and for the purposes of this funding process. Um, we're, we're looking to stay within one to three. Um, treatment is meant as an accountability measure um, and we're ex that is expected to produce enhanced survivor safety. And like Colorado, Washington State has um, implemented standards that dictate the credentials of treatment, um, uh, treatment providers and roles of the multidisciplinary teams that participate in intervention. So um, if you research or learn about the Colorado model, it's, um, it's something that is kind of instituted more at their state level. But even though Washington's kind of legal de facto like process around domestic violence is not necessarily, doesn't look necessarily like exactly like Colorado's. We still have st standards essentially that dictate what, um, what we're asking of our treatment providers. Um, so, and that's what this link is up here. And again, I'll send you that link in the chat at the very end. Um, there's a useful guide online uh, known as the Washington Administrative Code that provides and really nicely outlines what those requirements for treatment providers within this programming um, are expected to do. Okay. So getting into the model, um, there's several components to this model. The first is assessment. So after a, uh, an offender is um, referred by Seattle Municipal Court to um, assessment, um, they'll, they'll be seeing a treatment provider that um, is going to assess them and kind of assign them a level of treatment, that kind of one through three I mentioned earlier. And this assessment is going to integrate um, client risk, their needs, um, and their potential responsivity to treatment using multiple different measures. Um, and this, this process really works to integrate feedback from victim survivors as well um, as self-report. It's not just reliant upon self-report information from the offender. It actually takes into account um, information from the victor, victim survivor presented in court as well as pre, pre, um, presented voluntarily um, so that there's as much context as possible to uh, the violent behavior. Um, this model also allows for a gradated service model for misdemeanor level offenders based upon a set of risk factors that are self-reported, survivor reported, and based upon systemic input. So I mentioned that um, information from survivors can come from the court. Other inf we have a whole bevy of information that comes from essentially the court case um, that the person is, is um, kind of within so that we know kind of the severity, um, what they were charged with, the, the context around the incident for which they were being charged. Um, and we have information from probation as well that feeds this kind of assessment process. So an additional component um, of the service that we're looking to fund is, is treatment. So once, once offenders are assessed and assigned a level, um, either one through three, 
um, they're going to be in treatment. And these consist of weekly group sessions centered upon generally upon cognitive behavioral approaches. And um, generally speaking, treatment will last from six to 12 to 18 months. Um, treatment referrals to additional services that are not strictly offered through offender behavioral treatment can be provided as necessary. So as you can imagine, if we if we have someone who comes into treatment who um, has additional needs around um, substance use counseling or anything else, um, those referrals uh, will be provided by the service provider to that other service. Um, the treatment focus is primarily um, focused upon survivor safety, safety as well as offender accountability for past behavior and um, the competencies that the offender is expected to meet is um, are reflective of that of that accountability component and um, you'll see those when we kind of show you the performance metrics a little bit more you'll see how that's kind of phrased so that you can see how that offender accountability fits into this framework. Um, treatment needs to be compliant with the standards uh, set forth for providers by the Washington Administrative Code. Um, and that we um, we ask that the program is a minimum of six months um, per that code and advancement towards client completion as well as termination from the program is going to depend upon their uh, progress and involvement in, in treatment. Um, and again, those are those are defined by our performance metrics and those will be spelled out a little bit more a little bit later. Okay, and so kind of the final prong um, that we're expecting of, of folks um, within the treatment setting is that they participate in a multidisciplinary team or MDT. Um, this is a non-contractual obligation, uh, but per participants are expected to provide, um, if they do attend, provide monthly uh, updates and reports on program progress um, and uh, confer with systems and community partners to kind of figure out best practices and inform and strategize around emerging needs for clients. Um, multidisciplinary teams usually um, are consistent of treatment providers, probation, um, other community um, advocates perhaps. Um, it's, it's a group of people who are centered uh, first and foremost on offender accountability and victim safety. Um, so those are, um, that's kind of the the guiding ethos for the for the MDT. Per the Washington Administrative Code, uh, the role of the advisory committee is to advise the department regarding recommended changes to the program standards and provide technical assistance on program standards, their implementation, training, certification, and review certification criteria. So that's kind of what I what I was referring to when I was saying best practices, right? That's kind of guided by the Washington Administrative Code. Okay, so I wanted to go over the clients that we're kind of hoping um, to serve uh, within this funding process. Um, at the broadest level, um, the population that we're hoping to impact is Seattle residents or you know, residents within the Seattle community. Um, priority populations that we'd like to focus on um, and that are kind of de facto part of this, that pool are just right defendants of DB who are referred by Seattle Municipal Court. And for focus populations, um, as much as we can, we'd like to impact um, Black and African American communities, uh, Hispanic and Latino communities, as well as communities of immigrant and refugees. Um, really quick, I think someone's unmuted. Could you, could we do a mute check and make sure that everyone on the call has their mic muted, please? Thanks, sorry about that. Um, Okay, and then so then the program clients themselves um, are going to be those, as I mentioned, kind of within our priority populations. It's going to be those who are referred to DV treatment by Seattle Municipal Court. The survivors can be of any gender, sexual orientation, age, race, or ethnicity. Um, but again, hoping to focus um, or it have the greatest impact among folks who are American Indian, Alaskan Native, Black or African American. Um, they may be uh, domestic or foreign nationals as well. So I wanted to highlight the performance measures, um, both because I've alluded to them quite a bit at this point, but also because these are informed by kind of the treatment framework and also the Washington Administrative Code. 
around kind of like core competencies we're hoping um, folks, you know, kind of reach within the context of treatment. So um, within the city of Seattle, our performance measures usually kind of focus on quantity, quality, and impact. Um, so at the highest level kind of quantity, we're looking at the number of DVIP program participants um, or the or perpetrators who are enrolled in DVIP who are referred by the court. We're looking at the number of people who basically kind of make it into that first funnel. Um, beyond that, we want to measure the quality. We want to make sure that we're not just looking at number. Um, we want to look at um, kind of the outcomes. So the number of DVIP program participants who complete the intervention program requirements and the ones who uh, were satisfied with the quality of services as measured by client survey or interview. And this component is really where um, survivor voice is very central and important because ultimately it is about their safety. So um, if, the, if the victim partner feels as though um, the treatment has meaningfully impacted um, their lives, then that's, that's important. Um, the impact um, that we're hoping to have with, with what we're providing in this funding process is a um, uh, number of DVIP program participants who demonstrate a change in their beliefs. Um, which have resulted in a cessation of violent acts or threats for a minimum of at least six months, of the last six months, excuse me. And the number of program participants who demonstrate knowledge of their personal motives for abuse or controlling behaviors and uh, have alternative ways to meet their needs in a non-abusive manner. And so part of this, part of the MDT participation, when you're sharing data, these are the kind of things that um, are not the exclusive focus, but are, are things, elements, data points, if you will, that are um, of interest. So key staff um, that'll be involved in kind of building out this programming, um, there should be sufficient qualified culturally and linguistically competent staff um, to effectively conduct strategies outlined in, um, outlined in activities proposed uh, so that uh, referrals can be accessible accessible to all clients. So what this means is if um, as a provider, there might be uh, language access needs. If you cannot provide that yourself because of uh, staffing limitations, referrals can be provided um, to make that happen and meet that need. All program staff, supervisors, and volunteers um, at a bare minimum need to be familiar with the dy dynamics of domestic violence and relevant community resources. Um, we really think that successful app applicants need to be um, obtaining the required levels of training and accreditation for the assessment and treatment components. Um, the state DSHS uh, is pretty uh, clear about what certifications are needed um, in order to provide this uh, this training and, or excuse me, this uh, treatment. And um, staff must be D DSHS certified to provide those interventions for offenders. Um, and just as an aside, um, each uh, geographical location of a program um, must certify each program separately because the state considers those separate. Um, we know that we have um, we've worked with folks who have kind of multiple locations for their uh, for their treatment services, so we always like to make sure that that's clear. And finally, treatment and assessment responsibilities include administration and management of routine data reporting requirements and quality and performance measurement of the treatment program. So kind of that previous slide, I mentioned the, the performance metrics, um, kind of managing those is, is part of that onus is on the, the staff. Okay. So, I'm going to shift now kind of into our theory of change. Um, and this is something that um, HSD um, has adopted as it's it's a results uh, based accountability framework. And this is something that we um, it's a tool for us um, to kind of see within our funding processes to ensure that data informs HSD investments um, and that our partnerships can support culturally um, responsive approaches. And you may have seen this in the guidelines and applications document. Um, I'm saving it a little bit kind of towards the end after defining the programmatic elements, because um, I think it kind of helps to have those elements kind of in place before you kind of understand kind of where we're coming from in terms of framing up um, a theory of change and where we're trying to kind of close gaps. 
So this is a framework that also helps HSD um, understand how we can reduce and eliminate gaps in service of communities of color and immigrant and refugee communities locally. It's also a planning exercise for us that underscores how applicants who serve diverse and marginalized communities can be supported in their existing work and develop roadmaps for growth in the future. So um, it's it's a way of us, it's a way of kind of thinking and allowing us to kind of um, expand to to meet needs. And I'll I'll kind of define define things more concretely here in the next slide so that you can kind of see what that looks like. So um, we begin with our theory of change at the population level. So in terms of population level accountability, um, we always want to define who, what, and how um, with our funding process. So with our funding processes, we always like to ask who we want to impact. And in this case, it's obviously victims and survivors of um, gender-based violence um, in Seattle. And what we're wishing to achieve in the community is that all people in Seattle or in the greater Seattle area are free from gender-based violence and can live safe, thriving existences um, free, free from violence. And so how we know it's working, this gets back to um, and might be repetitive of those performance metrics I already outlined. But um, some things we're looking to to know that something is working, uh, treatment is working, is enrollment and completion. And um, number and percent of uh, women and men just broadly in Washington state that experience violence by an intimate partner um, and percent of women and men in Washington state that experience um, sexual violence as kind of comparison populations to kind of see, is Seattle out of the norm? Are we um, enrolling? Uh, more people than we would normally see at, say, a, a broader level? Are we seeing, you know, more people in our local community experiencing violence than are, are um, than exist kind of in the state, at kind of a state level? So, um, helps us to kind of define the shape of programming and how we know it'll be successful. That's what population accountability is. next kind of level and I like to think of these kind of le as levels that kind of drill down so I don't know if that I don't know if that helps folks but that that certainly helps me to kind of understand um, how this framework kind of kind of works um, the next level is community data we use community data to look at uh, racial equity and population accountability um, so previously we're right we're looking at Seattle community now we're kind of drilling down into our focus populations right so folks we would like to reach as much as possible as, as possible so Black and African American communities, Hispanic Latino communities, immigrant refugees, um, indigenous uh, communities as well. Um, and we know from our community level data that uh, for DV survivors, Black and African American and American Indian Alaska Native groups are overrepresented, both in King County Superior Court referred DV cases, as well as emergen emergency department visits in the past two years, meaning 2020 and 2021. Um, representation within Seattle Municipal uh, Probation Services is also disproportionate for offenders of color and specifically Black or African Americans in Seattle. So relative to representation in the greater Seattle community, um, the representation within those populations is, is just higher, right? So population rec racial equity goals that we're hoping um, to kind of uh, ideally track if we're if we know we're making an impact in the communities that we that we really want to is, is percent of Black or African American, Hispanic, Latino, and immigrant refugee populations who experience uh, domestic violence increases or cessation, and um, per percent decrease in domestic violence perpetrator recidivism. So how often folks reoffend to reduce that within those communities. Okay, and then the final level um, of within the theory of change, um, we use kind of those quantity, quality, and impact measures I, I showed you earlier to kind of gauge program um, how you know how is the program being accountable to our ultimate goal of ending DV in the community. So um, quantity, um, I already kind of mentioned this in, in kind of broader strokes, but specifically when we're looking at quantity, we're looking at the number or percent um, of unique, unduplicated program participants, right, who are brought in by the court. Um, as well as um, number of DVIP program participants who are referred by the court, who are from those, uh, who belong to those uh, focus populations that I just defined. In measuring quality, we're looking at the percent and number um, 
of unique uh, DVIP program participants from focused populations who complete, right? It's not just about enrollment. Enrollment is very much dictated, um, or at least referral is very much dictated by the court in this case, um, but who completes, that's kind of more of the, the true measure of whether or not um, the intervention is, is um, appropriate for that client and is working. And also uh, percent and number of unique uh, unduplicated program participants from that population who are satisfied with the quality of services provided. Um, and again, that kind of goes back to survivor um, uh, feedback around how safe they feel, whether they feel that the intervention worked for them and improved their safety. And finally, kind of the impact measure, already mentioned percent and number of unique DVIP participants um, from that focused population who demonstrate change in their beliefs who, that have resulted in cessation of violent acts for at least six months. And um, number and percent of uh, program participants from that focused population who demonstrate knowledge of their personal motives for abuse. Okay, so I'm going to um, open this up for questions and I'm gonna expand my panel. So pardon me if, if you see your face Brady Bunch style in, on the screen, I apologize, but um, it helps me to see helps me to see the um, the questions as they're coming up in the chat. So let me go get that. Okay. Michelle, can I call upon you to see if there's any questions in the chat right now? Um, just Alicia Guthrie. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, she wants to know if um, they're able to have a copy of this presentation. Yes. Yeah, we can give you the, the slides after if, if that's helpful. And we'll, we're taking notes and this is also being recorded, so. Um, but yes, if you want the slides, yeah, we can we can do that. And I also have a question from Emma. Um, notice at the racial equity, there's no mention of API. Yeah, that's not um, that's not in any way. Um, we're not trying to exclude in any way the API um, population um, from. I guess our racial equity framework was based on the data that we had that showed disparities. Um, and the data that we had um, for that exercise didn't show um, as much as we've seen in the past um, that community represented, but at the same time, we recognize that there is a need in the API community. So unfortunately, I know that it makes it look limiting um, to kind of just say like just these communities, but it's not exclusive to those communities. So um, I hope people know that that was more of kind of an illustrative example um, of kind of where we're looking to grow, if there's an interest in growing programming um, in terms of access to communities, I think that um, I think that, that is absolutely valid. And um, if there's a need in the API community, are you um, are seeing that? That is not in any way, we're not excluding that, I guess, is, is kind of my what I'm trying to say. There's also a question from Lynette Jordan uh, for DSHS certification and geographic locations. What if we have two locations in Seattle within a few miles of each location? Would that require separate certification? I believe so, um, but I can also, I can confirm that. And I don't know if anyone else on the call, Lon, if you're familiar um, or if anyone else is familiar, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's, it's each geographic location that needs to be state certified. Yeah, we definitely can can check with DSHS and get back to you. Uh, just to let you know that uh, all of the questions that are posed today, as well as the responses, will be available online. So um, whatever questions we are unable to clarify for you this morning, uh, you should be able to uh, log back to the website and see a response to that uh, within the next couple of days. Any other questions? Not seeing any other questions so far. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you all for those are all really great questions. Um, let's see. Is this the same webinar for GBV survivors or just you? Uh, 
Um, Megan, to get at your question, um, this is there's two different informa information sessions happening today. Um, this is for domestic violence intervention services only, and then later there's another uh, information session for uh, gender-based violence. That session's at 1 p.m. Um, if you don't have the invite for that session, let me know. I'll put my information in the chat. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle, for reading out the questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm going to continue and we'll kind of get more into the logistics of applying for the process and we'll have another kind of moment for questions at the very, very tail end of the presentation. So um, if there's something that we didn't get to right now or something that pops up as we go through the last couple bits, um, feel free to hold on to those until the very end. Okay. So, so for submitting your applications, um, I had previously mentioned that August 8th is the deadline that's going to be at noon Pacific time. Um, we have two different ways that you can submit. There's um, a link here, and again, I will send out, this is part of that link index that I'll send out at the very end of the presentation as well. Um, this is where you're going to submit online. And um, if you wish to email it, that is the other route of kind of applying, um, you can submit it with this subject line, this 2022 Domestic Violence Intervention Program Services, um, and then put this little attention here for me. Um, and I will provide you with my email um, at the end of the presentation as well so that you know how to get, get to me. Um, we'll, we won't be accepting faxed, mailed, or hand-delivered -deliver submissions. Um, they need to be complete and on time and either sent in via the link or sent in um, via email. Okay. So um, HSD online submission system, that link that I just shared with you, um, the system is not an online application. So um, there, what that means is there's no automatic or manual saving function available within the interface. So very strongly encourage you to, um, if, you, if you're writing out your application, do it in um, like a static Word file or something that can be saved to perhaps a desktop or, you know, your cloud or whatever, and then bring in that information into the web-based uh, platform once it's all fit to ship. Um, because doing it in the system, it's not going to automatically save your responses. Um, and so you, you can upload files, uh, attachment files up to 100 megabytes. Acceptable files um, include obviously PDFs, uh, doc or docx, so Word files, right? And then most Excel files are accepted as well. Um, there are going to be required fields to be completed when you apply online, so please make sure that you allow sufficient time to complete the steps in order to submit your application. Um, so we really encourage you to look at the, the online application kind of interface first before you even go in to submit your things so that you know what you're being asked to provide. Uh, the system will automatically send you a confirmation to all the email addresses you enter on your application, so are within the within the web-based form. Um, so you should get a confirmation if your uh, application is submitted successfully. Um, and so we advise you to upload all your proposal documents out several hours prior to the deadline in case there's any issues with internet connectivity or any uh, crashes in the system. Um, HSD is not responsible for ensuring that applications are received um, on time by the deadline. Um, if you are running into issues with your uh, submission system, uh, please uh, email Sola Plumaker at um, this address right here, um, sola.plumaker at seattle.gov, um, in order to kind of flag those or uh, let us know that you're encountering any issues at all. Okay. So um, submissions via email, if you're gonna go the other route and, and submit your application materials via email, um, we encourage you to submit it to this, uh, this address, uh, hsd underscore rfp underscore rfq underscore email underscore submissions at seattle.gov. 
So um, within this option, the uh, attachment sizes, the file sizes that you can upload are a little bit more limited in their size. They only accept the 30 megabytes. Um, the subject heading must be titled 2022 DVIP Services RFQ. Um, any risks associated with submitting the proposal by email are going to be borne by the participant or by the applicant. Um, and you'll receive an email acknowledging the receipt of your application. So we really encourage you to submit either online or via email um, and not both. Um, if for any reason the proposal is submitted twice, whichever submission has the most recent timestamp on it will be the one that's accepted for review by the rating panel. Okay, so this is what you'll need for a complete application. Um, late applications will not be accepted, and HSD is not responsible for ensuring that applications are received by the deadline. Um, they are gonna, you're going to want to include an application cover sheet with a physical signature uh, ready to go. The core narrative response, which we've set, I think, I believe a 12-page limit for, um, so need it to be you know, within reason. Uh, we're going to need a strategy, service strategy profile, um, your narrative answer to narrative questions. Um, your proposed program budget and proposed personnel detail budget form, uh, proof of uh, status as an IRS nonprofit legal entity or tribe, um, the current board of directors roster, and minutes from the last uh, three board of directors meetings, as well as a um, federally approved indirect rate if that's applicable to your organization. So this, these are materials that are outlined as well in the guidelines and application documents. So if you've not already reviewed that, we encourage you to review that. Okay, so um, fiscal documents, agencies for which HSD has a current financial and insurance document will not be required to resubmit those documents. If you have questions regarding whether you or your organization have current financial documents filed with us, please inquire by July 29th um, at five by emailing me um, to see if you if you have them um, on file with us. Agencies for which HSD has incomplete or no financial or insurance documents will be notified by the coordinator and required to submit all the requested documents within four business days from when um, the request was made. Um, and this kind of time period is tentatively scheduled for roughly the beginning of September 2022 because our announcement is obviously the end of September. And financial and insurance documentation uh, that may be requested are listed in our uh, application document. So anything that you need should be listed, should be listed there. Okay, so getting into the rating process, this is how we've decided to weight um, our, um, our rating uh, scores. So obviously you can see there's a, um, a strong emphasis on cultural humility as well as capacity and experience. Um, we wanna recognize that an eye towards cultural competence and humility is necessary um, as well as uh, folks who, who have the capacity to provide this programming. Um, and then uh, program design description um, is also very important, but we also obviously have to include partnership uh, and collaboration as well as budget, budgeting and leverage, uh, leveraging. So gives you kind of the, an idea of what we're hoping to prioritize for this process. Okay. So the steps for review and rating. Um, once applications are submitted, our rating committee will uh, review the complete applications. Um, Post-application interviews will take place uh, if needed by the rating committee. This is not um, always done, but if, if it is needed, then uh, that will that will come together. Um, then there's the fiscal review, and then um, after the fiscal review is complete, we make our um, the rating committee will make their recommendations to our uh, interim director, and finally the agency um, will will uh, post a public announcement regarding who has received funding. Okay, so some tips that um, I wanted to kind of review for you around what makes um, our applicants successful in these funding processes is we really encourage you to follow the required format uh, defined in the guidelines and application document. 
um, really try to, I know we made this, this um, the responses, the core narrative uh, page limit, I, I believe 12 pages. Um, so we really want you to prioritize specificity while being as concise as possible. Um, kind of just keep it, keep it simple, but keep it direct um, as to what you're hoping to provide. Um, please answer all questions um, in the context of your proposed programs. Try not to keep it, you know, really hypothetical. Try to keep it very grounded in what you do. Um, please try to submit an accurate budget and double check your numbers. Um, propose plans for addressing services that are not currently in place. It's also kind of a good framework to bring into answering the questions. Okay, and then um, have someone else review your application for submitting. This is not just important within the budget, the context of the budget. Um, it's really important to do this um, for everything to make sure that you're kind of doing a, a kind of a, a sense check before you, you submit all your documents. Um, please do not exceed the 12 page narrative limit um, and use the application submission checklist. In that guidelines and application document, there's a really handy submission checklist um, that will help you kind of review uh, whether or not you have all the documents you need. Um, we really encourage you to start early. Um, I know that summer is a, is a busy time for folks, but um, if you can submit as early as possible so that you, you know, if you realize that you need to resubmit because you left off a document, you can still do that. And it's not like the process is closed. So please, please try to start as early as possible and um, review our um, online submission assistance page for helpful information. And that's this link right here. And again, that will be part of the link index at the end. And if you have any questions um, before July 29th at 5 p.m., um, you can email me at this email address, uh, carmen.sure2 at seattle.gov. So, and I'll put that in the link index as well. Okay. So really quickly, our appeals process kind of is as follows. Um, you have the right to protest or appeal certain decisions in the award process. Um, the grounds for appeals can look like Kind of two different things, either the violation of policies outlined in our funding process manual for our department, or if there's a violation of policies or failure to adhere to guidelines or published criteria or procedures for the funding opportunity itself. Um, we encourage you to submit your appeals. Uh, they need to be received within four business days of when uh, written application status, either award or denial, takes place. Um, a written decision by our director um, will be made within four business days of the receipt of the appeal, and that direction or that decision is going to be final. Um, so once there's a decision after an appeal, you can't appeal again. You would just get the one appeal. So, um, and none of the contracts that are um, kind of up to be executed will be executed until that process has that appeal process has closed. That has to close before any sort of um, contract can be executed. Um, and any appeal, or let's ooh, get this out of the way so that you can actually see this. Come on now. Any appeal may not prevent HSC from issuing an interim contract for services to meet important client needs. That's right. Okay. Make sure everybody can see that. Okay. All right. So if you have any questions, um, please submit. Um, your questions, you can submit them directly to me at this email address. Um, we also have our RFP website here that you can consult if you have kind of more general questions. Um, written answers from us are considered official. Um, so if you email me with a written question, that's considered official disposable record. If you have any issues or questions about the online submission system, please, uh, as I mentioned before, contact Sola, who's the funding process advisor um, here. And um, yeah, give yourself enough time to review the information so that you can submit questions before this deadline. Um, really encourage that so that you can get everything you need to feel like you're putting together a good application. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you, these are the links I wanted to leave leave uh you can feel free to ask questions i just wanted to leave these links up for you all um make sure let's see okay yeah um are there any additional 
questions that folks have about the logistics of submitting, about the program itself, about DVIP, what it's meant to do, um, the model, anything at all. Carmen, not seeing any questions so far. Okay. Yeah, I kind of want to give people give people a second because if they're going to type it into the chat, that's to do. Let's see here. Okay. Okay. Come on there. Gonna go fetch these links for everybody so that they can you guys can actually like see what I put in here because I know that links in pa in PowerPoint presentations are kind of wonky. So here, let me enter this information in. There we go. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, if there's not any other questions, um, and as mentioned, you know, feel free to reach out to me um, at my email, um, which is in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being here. I know that um, it's early Monday morning or relatively early Monday morning and appreciate everyone, everyone being here. So appreciate the work you do and uh, that it's, it's a busy time, but I uh, hope that you have enough information to kind of feel empowered to do a Strong application. Oh. Wish you very good luck <laughs> as well. I know. Okay. I will stay on just so that I can get all the chat info real quick. Um, I guess I don't have to share my screen anymore. So sure. Okay. Oh, we have a question. Hang on. Let's see. Okay. There's a question from Alicia. Um, does this application require that we offer services at no cost? Um, or is this an administrative grant to provide services? Let's see here. My understanding is that it's a sliding scale. Lon, I think they, it, maybe you could help me with this. I, I, I remember correctly, it's that um, there's a sliding scale um, being asked of clients um, who, who are enrolled and depending on their ability to meet the financial requirements they're they're paying themselves is is my understanding for the most part. Yeah, let us check and get back with you. Um, we are um, holding this process, but actually the services uh, are really led by the Seattle Municipal Court. This is a court mandated program. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. We would like to uh, get clarification on that and get back with you um, and. We should have the response also online. So let us, uh, we hate to, you know, um, provide any responses without uh, checking back. So um, I, I guess the link is provided and so sorry, sorry we can't answer this morning, but we definitely will get back with you within the next 24, 48 hours. So please check onto the web link that is provided in the chat box. Okay. Good question, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, Carmen, I do have the DVIP chat. 
um, cut and pasted into a Word document. So, oh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, folks are welcome to stay if they have additional questions. Um, we have the slot until I believe noon. Um, so if there's anything that comes up, welcome to ask questions. So welcome to do as you will. Lon, are there objections to ending the meeting or closing out if folks don't have questions? No, I think if there aren't any more questions, uh, we can close out the meeting. And uh, since your information is already provided in chat box, if folks have questions um, later today, they definitely can send an email to us. Okay. That works for me. Um, I, I might close this out then. Could I ask something quickly? Sure. I'm so sorry. My colleagues were here from Northwest Family Life and I mixed up the time thinking that it started an hour later. Um, so I can get information from them, but I also just wanted to see if you by chance recorded your session. Yes. Yeah. Um, we did record the session. We can also provide you with the slides as well. That would be outstanding. Thank you. And my apologies. Yeah, would you, um, are you comfortable providing your email in the chat or would, would you want to, would I you want to so. do that or, or you can just email, yeah. email me directly. My email's right there too. Um, I know how to contact you. Are you Carmen speaking? Yes. Yeah, sorry. No, my, my bad. I will, um, I just dropped it in the chat, but I will also email you Carmen. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for your time in sharing about this RFP. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Sorry about that. I'm sorry that happened. <laughs> I just, you know, summertime and kids and I just booked it an hour later in my head. That's okay. Well, all been there. Thanks for being graceful. Okay. 
Anything else from anyone? Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out then. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.